Do you know most people fight in relationships? Yeah, I know it sucks, right? Whether you just started dating somebody or maybe you've been married for many years and you're saying, God damn, I hate fighting. Today, I have a couple that claims you will not fight in your relationships with the right mindset, mentally, emotionally, and of course, physically. But wait, if you're saying, well, I've given up on love, don't. Why do I say this? Because this couple is going to blow your mind and going to give you the five C's on how to conquer your relationship. Stay tuned. You're now tuned in to Get Inspired with Jason Roselle, the podcast and YouTube show. The Get Inspired with Jason Roselle show brings you amazing topics and a variety of guests ranging from celebrities, reality stars, social media influencers, entrepreneurs, and major success stories. You're going to gain a large amount of knowledge and priceless advice. It doesn't matter if it's in childhood trauma, anxiety, depression, raising up and leveling up your business. The Get Inspired show is going to get you thriving. So if you're ready to transform your life in all areas, get ready because the show starts now. Melissa and Akshay, thank you so much for joining the Get Inspired show. How are you? Doing well, brother. Thanks for having us. Doing so well. I'm very excited to be here. And you and you both look, may I add, very caliente. Thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. So, you know, Akshay, you were on the show not too long ago. We're about to embark into 2024. And, you know, people are, you know, having hard times when it comes to relationships with themselves, their couples. And, you know, a lot of people reached out to me and said, man, Akshay says, he does not get in fights with his fiance and he doesn't plan on getting in fights. I want to learn more because he has so much wisdom. We have Akshay Nanavati. He's an author, explorer of life, and has overcome drug addiction, PTSD from fighting in Iraq with the Marines. And right next to him, his beautiful fiance, her name is Melissa Nanavati, who are going to share their love story. And Melissa is also an author, a keynote speaker, a best selling author i mean let's see wait, get ready and wait wait it gets better they're gonna share with us write this down ladies and gentlemen the five c's on how to conquer your relationship let's go let's go all right so melissa i met your fiance akshay about five months ago this man was literally whole literally with a rope uh, uh, around his waist dragging a super and i mean super heavy monster uh, attire and i was like what the hell are you doing dude it's 120 <laughs> degrees we start we started chatting right Th this guy well i don't have to tell you he's awesome he's just done so much and we we became instant buddies right then and there uh while i was boiling and about to pass out meanwhile he's like yeah but i'm like motherfucker. <laughs> like <laughs> hold on hold on so he tells me in the sequence, he's like, he's single, he's doing, you know, this exhibition to Antarctica. And then we connect not too long ago. He's like, yeah, man, I'm engaged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, interesting. <laughs> Tell us more of the background of how you two connected and then the development story as to why and how you spoke about everything that was important within the relationship to ultimately be in the sequence you are now. Yeah, absolutely. So we initially connected because I came to Scottsdale kind of on an intuition that my person was here. And I started going to different events where I could meet like-minded people. And I met a mutual friend that introduced us, who is someone that runs uh, Unoptimized here. So he has like uh, these ice bath workshops where he teaches people breath work. And I was very clear that I was looking to meet someone. So we ended up getting connected, went on what we now define as the death march uh, through the desert. It was a five and a half hour hike where he hadn't eaten in five and a half days. And I had an allergic reaction that caused my eyes to swell pretty much shut. So we spent five and a half hours going super deep into our values, our history, what we were looking for, and had built actually this foundation that he doesn't remember 80% of, 
<laughs> which later led me to ask him on our first date. And so from the very beginning, we were used to going deep with each other, even beyond the hike on our first date, we talked for three and a half hours about our core values, the things that we were looking for, and really didn't do any of the, the normal first date or second date topics. Right. And from there, we continued to stay at this deep level to really make sure it was worth both our time investment, especially with him at the time with being scheduled to go to Antarctica in just a few months. Wow. 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 So, so I like also too, I love ladies and gentlemen, pick, did you, I'm sure you picked up on it. She asked Akshay on a day, right? You see, you see how the, 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 you know, but let's just go. Let me go a little further back here because a lot of people watching or listening, they may be single and they've just given up on love, right? And sometimes they, you have to realize a lot of people wait for things to happen, right? Let me wait to make money. Let me wait to find my partner. It doesn't work like that. You have to put in the work. One thing Akshay said in the previous uh, se season of, of, of the show, he said, you know, we both did a lot of work and been through so much of our personal journey that it got us into the sequence of where we're at parallel, right? So talk to me a little bit, uh, uh, Melissa, about your struggles and then Akshay, you as well, what you, how you went through them, what you did to conquer them and where it put you now together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Go ahead. absolutely. So something we both kind of share is we both struggled with alcohol at a certain point, right? So I had my own journey with that as well. I've been sober for about a little over five years now and had really made like some big choices around that, even beyond, you know, the sobriety piece, but really diving deep into my own personal development, every podcast book I could get my hands on. And then Ultimately, what really I had to overcome also was I had chronic anxious attachment, which if you know, I, I know you oh, know yeah. deeply about attachment theory. And so I spent a lot of time working through that aspect of it and even went to, uh, you may have heard of 40 Years of Zen. Yes. It's a five-day meditation neurofeedback retreat where you go really deep into that stillness within. And it was through doing a ton of forgiveness work of self, of others, of past relationships that I was able to get to a point where I truly healed my anxious attachment. And what better of a gift than someone who's going to be gone for four months uh, to really test whether or not you've healed that. And that's why we often say, like, if we had met at any other point in time, it wouldn't have necessarily worked because we both had our own journeys. And I, you know, speaking for myself, I had only really worked through anxious attachment mm, four months before we met. So wow. it was fairly recent that I had like done a lot of that deep excavation. Wow. And, 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 and before we get to Akshay real quick. I want to clarify this to the audience because a lot of times people were unaware about attachment style. So you have an anxious, anxious attachment style, which is someone that's obviously essentially needy. Okay. And I say that because <laughs> I, I I'm half needy myself. Um, someone that's, you know, constantly craving attention, wanting, where are you? What are you doing? They, that's how they were raised. Right. And part of do with our childhood. Then you have a secure attachment style, which is a little mixture of both, you know, meaning, you know, you, you're an avoidant, but you also like to be attached right in the middle, right? Little Akshay coming up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And then you have the avoidant detachment style, right? Someone that they like attention, but they prefer their space. They're like, leave me the F alone. I'm in my rhythm X, Y, Z. So if anyone's watching or listening saying, well, what am I You've determined that now. Now, Akshay, let's go on to you on your work. And what kind of attachment style do you have? You know, I wasn't as familiar with the with the framework of attachment styles. And I would say having done all the work just now understanding it, it was very secure. Certainly wasn't like this in my younger days. I remember my yeah. first year's relationship in college, super needy, clingy, like just an idiot compared to who I am today. But mm -hmm. as we spoke about last time, right, I've been to war, navigated PTSD, depression, addiction, running ultra marathons, playing on the edges, volunteering in post-conflict zones, working with survivors of sex trafficking, former child soldiers. So having seen all edges of the human condition, battling my own you know, b uh, battles with alcoholism as well, being on the verge of suicide, coming all of, uh, out of all of that, right? From delving into neuroscience, psychology, spirituality, as you know, spending time in darkness retreats, going deep within the self, I've been to Antarctica before, done expeditions on the edge, 
that allowed me to confront myself and open the doors inside my own soul that I had never opened before, before going to this level of stillness and solitude. And only through opening those doors was I able to bring what's unconscious to the surface and then navigate it, deal with it, use it as my tool to drive me forward. And that's why I've become very, as you you know, asked me the other day when we were speaking, like very Zen, very peaceful, not being charged by anything, not being in a fight with her <laughs> or with anybody for that matter, right? Because I've played on those edges and been able to find stillness in a storm. Absolutely. So what has the been the background with you two? Because, you know, I get a lot of questions, uh, people that have been through really just bad toxic relationships. And, you know, Melissa, have you have you had your heart broken once, twice, many times? Have you been in serious relationships? Give us a little background background. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd been in, I would say really like three very serious relationships prior. And each of them uh, had things that I had to heal and work through in their own right. Everything from, um, you know, being very close to someone who was actually diagnosed as a sociopath, uh, being cheated on in past relationships. So yeah, we all, we didn't come from easy experiences when it comes to relationships. It's not that I had never had my heart broken, never been in a fight before with someone previously, but it was taking those, those experiences and pulling away, like, what were the lessons? Where could I have taken more ownership to? Because I think there's often a default of, all right, blame the, the quote, crazy ex or blame the other person. It's like, all right, we all participate. Right. And like, what was my role in those, in those arguments, in those situations and where do I have room to grow? And so really taking that lens on the history is what allowed us to both to be here now is not blaming past partners or anyone else for any of the issues, but ourselves. Wow. Akshay, you are one lucky guy, man. That's I so, am, <laughs> that is so, can I get a what, what? Oh, <laughs> woo. Oh, I got, I got, I got chills, girl. Woo. <laughs> That's the thing. It's taking responsibility, Right. So let me just recap. So you've dated a, a sociopath, right? Mm -hmm. You dated someone that cheated on you, right? Multiple. And we'll, yes. Multiple. <laughs> multiple. Yeah. So, so ladies or gentlemen, there is time. Okay. Like you can still heal. What about you, Akshay? What have, have you been, have you had your heart broken? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I was actually married for nine years. Uh, my, without going too deep into that story, my ex-wife yeah. got caught up in a cult. But we had like a very good marriage for about five, six of those years before she went down this very dark rabbit hole, got caught up in a cult and our marriage ended. That's I actually broke my sobriety when that happened. Even before this, I had a couple of serious relationships, but that one was a very long one that was going very well for a long time. And I ended up not to, again, not to blame her, but I take responsibility for my own actions. But when that ended, I broke my sobriety and I got into a very, very dark place because, you know, most times when there's a divorce you're kind of fighting or anything. We didn't have that. We actually had a good relationship. It's just, she, she went down this dark path and it, and it ended, you know, yeah. but to your point, like whatever the past stuff, like even the other day I was talking to this kid, the, a friend of mine, and he was saying how he just ended a long relationship that was quite bad. And he was, he felt like it was a waste of time. And the whole reframe is both of us have had that. It's not a re waste of time. Nope. It made us the kind of people that we are today to bring this to each other and why we can say very, very confidently, we won't get in a fight. Why we have what I would qualify, classify as a perfect relationship, you know, because all of that stuff has built us into who we are today. Absolutely. What do you tell people out there? Um, you know, say we were all on a podium right now, speaking, giving a lecture. What if it's someone that say was married at some point, they got divorced and years go by one person healed, the other person he healed. Is there a second chance of love or if a lot of toxicity happened and occurred it's probably best not to give it a shot. What do you think? What's both your takes on that? You want to go first? Yeah, I think it depends on the people. I think it depends on the type of work that each person has done. I think that, you know, having a conversation with that person is not out of the realm of possibility. If you have both grown, you know, at, in similar ways that made you more compatible now. But I think the likelihood of that is much lower, right? Because each person doing their own healing work, what were the lessons they took away from that relationship? Probably pretty different. Right. So I think it's it's always worth having the conversation, but I, you know, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules when it comes to matters of the heart, as long as when people engage with each other, they're they're engaging from that place of ownership. Yeah. You as well, Akshay, or yeah, building on that, you know, it's as long as something's changed, if you're coming back to it and you're the same issues, 
how is it going to go any differently, right? And often we do, we cling back to that because that's what we know. Sometimes people will stay in a terrible relationship and God knows I've done this before Before my uh, I was married with my first serious relationship. You stay in this knowing it's terrible because there's this feeling that there's nothing else out there. And, you know, maybe sometimes conscious and often just subconscious that there's nothing else out there. But if nothing's changed, it's not going to fix itself. If you have radically changed and both parties have taken ownership, created some change, as Melissa was saying, then there potentially could be a hope of rebuilding. But you have had to have done some significant work individually to bring new paradigms, new constructs, new belief systems, new ways to operate into what is potentially a new relationship. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up a failure once again. A hundred percent. You, you, it's, it's again. We go back to the work, the work, the Absolutely. work. Most people do not want to put in the work. It's hard. You don't want to put in the work to constantly develop, right? It's like an onion has so many layers, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not willing to grow, learn, grow, learn, you're gonna be stagnant, and you're always going to have like. My mom always says misery loves company. Stay in that miserable place. And then you're just like, well, why, why can't I find my husband? I want to share in my life. Why can't I have him? And then they're like, I want a Melissa, damn it. I don't, know where my, I don't know where this southern accent just came from, but my, my point is, you know, it's that southern love. It's like, guys, put in the work. Let, let's play a little game. Um, Akshay, Melissa, do you know your love languages? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, Melissa, go first. Give me from first to the fifth one. Go. First from fifth. Ooh, I've always done the top two. So my top one is physical touch. Okay. And two is words of affirmation. I believe acts of service is probably third. Okay. Um, quality time. And then the fifth one is escaping. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's how much I care about it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. What about you, Akshay? I haven't thought about all five in the order mm -hmm. too, but I would say a number one is also touch. And number two would probably be acts of service. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I, look, I One thing that I tell, you know, a lot of my uh, life and relationship uh, coaching clients and students in my academy is know thyself, right? Know you who you are. Know your partners. Because a lot of times we get prone to me, me, me. This is me, right? Yeah. Okay, and great. There's, like, exactly. You, you have to. If Say Melissa's, uh, I don't know, physical touch was in the bottom. You know, like, hey, in order to get physical touch from Melissa, I got to maybe as an example, do more acts of service, or maybe yeah. she likes gifts. Yeah. So learning both is essential. But I will tell you, love languages is not enough. Why? Okay, I've, I've met people, I've had students in my academy, kid you not, their horoscope signs were like, perfect. Oh, I'm a Pisces, I'm a Virgo. And I'm like, Oh, that's a great match. What about their childhood trauma? You already know the deal, right? Like, Example, if you had narcissistic parents, that is a disease. They There's a disease there. More than likely, unless there was changes in infancy, the children came out narcissists as well, right? There's certain things you cannot change. Same thing, clinical depression. You can't, you can't change certain people, but what you can do is adapt, learn, and work on yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care if you're single, married, dating, divorce, I don't care the deal. Melissa and Akshay claim they do not fight and will never fight. Tell us why and also introduce us to the five C's on how to conquer your relationship. Why don't you start with tell us why yeah. and then we'll jump to the five yeah. C's. Give it to us. Yeah. So it's kind of like this framework that we've developed that we call conflict-free communication. Uh, hint, that's the third C. <laughs> so really it's about not expecting mind reading, right? So when things come up for you and may, may they be small or something big, bringing it up to your partner, bringing it up in a compassionate way. And that really helps to avoid any sort of potential conflict. When both people assume there's positive intention, you really approach it as a team and you're looking for a solution. It's you, your partner, and the issue, not your partner is the issue. Mm -hmm. And that's a really key distinction. So we do that even over the smallest little things, right? Like everyday things, you know, how we load the dishwasher, very basic things, but we're constantly bringing up anything that could potentially become an issue before it does. And that was a commitment we made to each other. I think even in like week one or week two was that we would never allow resentment to build up because really that's where conflict arises. A hundred and ten percent. So, but let's just say, you know, for people that, that have, that maybe are 
angered right now. They're like, yeah. they've given up. So let's start from scratch. So say you met, you know, your potential boyfriend, girlfriend, or maybe it's your current husband or wife, right? What's the sit down talk you both had initially, right? Mm -hmm. Like if it's a ping pong match on how you got to this place now, like break it down for them before you give them the five C's as to the claim, we will never ever fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll say, um, and then I obviously want to hear your, your take on this as well, was that really initially we both came into this with a commitment of, we don't want this to end. We want this to be our forever. So having that intention, we're like, how do we prevent any future conflict? And it yeah. was both of us having that intention and almost like, you know, coming from a place of like, wow, this is, this is so good. We want to preserve this forever. And, and when you come at it with that frame of sitting down and saying like, I love you. I want to be with you forever. Right. So this is your forever partner, or, you know, I want us to be the happiest we can be and coming at it from that lens. It's not like, Oh, let's, let's stop fighting. It's like, how do we really create a framework and a relationship to engage with each other that keeps us at our most optimal like selves, how we can both pursue the things we want to pursue and be the happiest version of ourselves in our relationship together. Yeah. Yes. You know, Mm -hmm. And same thing, like, you know, for earlier on, we also, we, we made a, we did make a decision. Let's not ever fight. So let's have those hard talks because people, sometimes they hear that and they think it's because we're burying things under the rug, but yeah. we're not, we have the toughest conversations. We've talked about everything. Right. And we talk like, let's say that, like, for example, one of the things that was a potential point of friction for me was my adventurous lifestyle. Uh -huh. You know, I do crazy things, as you know, about to go to Antarctica for four months. And then her concern, which was a very valid concern was what's next after that. Are you going to keep doing this every, every year? Are you going to be gone for four months? And there was a moment where we really had a deep talk about this, of how we're going to navigate this. And I even told her, I was like, I'll be very honest with you. Having this conversation, it made me feel stifled a little bit. And she was kind of like, thank you for sharing that. And I, and she was also like, I was also nervous that what if you choose adventuring over me, but because we were able to very vulnerably share what we're, what we were feeling without making each, like, this is coming back to the inner work that we both did. She didn't make what I said mean anything about her and vice versa. So we could hear the other person, accept that their feelings are valid. This is a huge reason why people fight. It's like, you should not feel this way. Yeah. We're not saying that in so many words, but it's like, you should not feel this way. You should think the way I think. That's kind of what we're saying. So it creates conflict instead of saying, got it. I appreciate that you felt this way. I respect that you felt this way. You're making the other person feel seen, felt, and heard. You're acknowledging the validate, you're validating that they have the right to feel what they feel. And then we just have a civil discussion about it. We make sure not coming back to, uh, coming back to this foundation is mastery of the self so that we don't let shit trigger us, even in the external world. Cause here's the thing. If you let shit trigger you in the external world, you will let your partner trigger you. Like this is the person you're living with, right? But that's why when, when something happens in the external world, we don't get phased. We're able to stay still, be the eye of the storm, right? So when things happen here, we don't let our, we can respond to our emotions instead of reacting to them. So this doesn't mean we also don't feel our emotions. We feel intensely, right? We're not I'm not avoiding our emotions. She's allowed to feel sad, as am I. You know, we've had moments where she's teared up about things and we feel it fully, but we never escalates into a fight because we say, got it. Hey, we may think differently about these things, but let's talk about how we're going to address it. And then we create systems and structures and frameworks to address it. So coming back to the adventure thing, she, she even said, you know, look, I, I support you going off. If you want to go off and do another two, three month expedition, all I ask is that you don't do it every year. And I was like, you know, that's very fair. Yeah. Got it. And I also <laughs> said, because her, her fear was that I'm just going to go do things without even addressing it to her. Because mm -hmm. at the time we had just met. And I was like, that's a very fair concern. But I want to be clear that we're in this together. This is very much an essence of who I am. But whenever something comes up, we'll talk about it. We'll figure it out. I'm not going to just run off and go climb a mountain on without telling you. So we'll figure it out to negotiate because we don't want our, our, our relationship to compromise our individual purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Purpose and connection. It's the two things that every human being wants at the core of their soul. What is their meaning? What are they striving for? And that deep human connection, that love. So we are always making sure that we will not let one come in the way of the other for, for each of us, right? Her purpose, I will support her. I will be with her. And she is, goes above and beyond in supporting me, especially mine's a pretty unique one because of what I do, right? Going off into some crazy places, but we support each other and not let our purpose come in the way of the connection and vice versa. So that's yeah, I'm telling you, that's a lot. OK, so let's be I'm going to be like uh, I'm I'm going to act like someone is super negative right now and saying so far. <laughs> what do I do? I mean, I, physical touch. I mean, what I, when Akshay has gone for so long, well, how long are you going to be gone? Be honest. Four months, four months, four months. 
And let's just play devil's advocate, right? Melissa, you're lonely, right? You're craving a big old juicy Akshay hug, <laughs> a little loving, or like on my workout DVDs, a little sex exercise. Let's talk about it. Well, what do you do? I mean, do you just have patience and say, you know what? Love conquers all. It's going to be worth it. I support this man. It's all good. Is that it? Is that right? Really? What it I mean, down? that's part of it. But also, so one of my hobbies is partner dance. So maybe I'll go dancing more often because physical touch needs, the way you get them met isn't always just from your partner. And I think that's sure. another important thing to remember is that your partner doesn't have to fulfill all of your needs. Right. right. So like, I'm going to hug my friends a whole lot that four months. Right. You know, so those are going to be those moments, but also creating that contrast, actually having the time away from him is going to make it even more special when he gets back and leading up to it. You know, we're always next to each other. We're always holding hands. Even, even we were at my parents this past uh, weekend for Thanksgiving and we would sneak our feet under the table to set our feet on top of each other so that we could always be in contact. And those little moments, you know, and that's how we we fill that need. But recognizing that we do have this time apart, that contrast makes this time more valuable. So how do I deal with it? It's savoring the right now. It's being super present with him always, not being distracted, not letting the distractions go away. And wow, are my friends going to get a lot of hugs those four months? Yeah. I love that. You know, I think a lot of it has to also come down to boundaries, right? Those healthy boundaries, understanding what we all need in, uh, within ourselves and our partner, right? Everyone is different. But what I like about your story, it's uh, I'm huge on structural, excuse me, structure equals strategy. And without structure, there is no strategy, right? And going into a partnership such as, husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, you have to lay ground rules, right? What makes me happy? What makes me tick? Vice versa, mm -hmm. right? So say, for example, Akshay is number one, like you said, physical touch, but yours was not. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself, A, do I want to be with someone that hugging, loving, and all that is maybe not, right? Totally. Um, the other thing is ask yourself, how do people react to the other person, like you said earlier, Akshay, reacting and responding. If we can respond, that's when we're in our power. When we're reacting, we give away our power. You know, guys, one of the biggest things that I work with individually with my clients and students in my academy, when it comes to relationships, I always say, listen, work on yourself. Become the best version of yourself. Do the work. Write the pros. Write the cons of yourself, what you're happy with, what you're not happy with. Okay, cool. Let me work on the things that I'm not happy with and what you want from a partner, right? Uh, are you okay if he goes on exhibitions? Are you okay if he drinks alcohol? Are you okay if he does have a close family or not, right? All those little things are huge things. Now, what do you tell somebody, Melissa Nakshay? that, you know, before they found the love of their life, how to get there, right? Because you're going to give us tips on the five C's, but how do we walk us through the journey? Say they, they're they sick and tired of, like you said, the dating apps, or maybe they found the person. Give us, for both male and female perspective, how to get there, find the love. Yeah, I'm happy to share. So <laughs> both of us actually made lists of what we were looking for quality-wise in the other person before we ever met. So we both had our list. So it's exactly to your point of like yep. getting clear on what you're looking for and not all the superficial stuff, right? Like not like how tall they should be, what their hair color should be like, but the real stuff, like what are the core values? And that was actually one of the first questions I asked him on our first date was, what are your values? What do you value most? And, and we both had integrity as number one. So getting clear on that first off, but then second, you know, and I, I had mentioned to you that I was on all the dating apps. I had been, I'd even worked with matchmakers. I had done everything, wow. all the digital things, right? But ultimately the commitment that I made to myself, especially moving to a new city was I need to be around new people every week. And I did not want to go out, you know, four days a week, whatever that was, but I made a commitment to myself to go out one day per week, do one new activity every single week where I could be around like-minded people, like the, the breathwork workshop that I went to, like, you know, these entrepreneur networking groups, but I went to one thing every week. And I was very clear with people that I met that weren't, you know, potential suitors, essentially that I was looking to meet someone. I didn't want business contacts. I wanted to meet someone and it was a very vulnerable place to be, but that's ultimately what led us to meeting each other. Wow. Wow. But see, I love that because it's intentional, right? 
And when you're intentional, see, I have a few people through my past or even presently, they're so used to their routine, right? They go to work and then they go to their Gold's Gym or to the LA Fitness. Oh yeah, I'm going to meet Eduardo and Mikey and Jessica. They're my buddies at the gym. And I'm like, dude, you got to get out of your circle, right? Yes. Because we become complacent, right? It's the same thing, Akshay, same thing, you know, you're in great shape. If we do the same workout every day, we're not going to get awesome results. So yeah, what you've always done, you'll get more of what you've always gotten. Mm -hmm. You know, amen. What about, let's go back to someone that's not comfortable in their skin, right? You know, like say they're not happy with what they look like. They don't want to go to events. You know, mm -hmm. how do we, how do we twist their arm a little bit, you know? Yeah. I think the biggest thing there too, is even telling your immediate circle. I think the biggest thing is, you know, we're afraid to tell people I want a relationship. I'm looking for a partner because it's a vulnerable thing to share. But if you even share that with your friends, with your, you know, close network, maybe they know someone, maybe they can set you up. Right. And you're, you're most likely to meet somebody like-minded through people you already enjoy. So if you are too nervous, I think that that's a great place to start is opening up to your close circle and letting them know and saying like, these are the things I'm looking for. True, also, but, oh, sorry. Go ahead. What, go ahead. No, so I was going to say to build on that. If you're, if you want to jump in, but I can, I was going to build on it. I, I was just going to challenge her. What yeah, if, no and you know this, what <laughs> if you're like the cooler one in your circle, right? And I'm, I'm really big mm -hmm. on this. If your circle is not smarter, doing better things than you, you got to get a new circle, right? And I say this because I know plenty of female, especially platonic friends that tell me, you know, I got my female girlfriends, but they're either jaded, they're divorced, they're always complaining. I'm like, maybe, I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> I'm just saying, what, what, so would you say maybe they should try finding new friends if their circle's kind of like already kind of like in the whims of giving up in life? <laughs> A hundred percent, because you don't want to surround yourself also with that same negativity. It's like, I've, I've told some women that say like, oh, you know, there's no good men, right? That's something that is often said in female circles. I'm like, you're hanging out with the wrong women, because yeah. if you perpetuate that belief, you will always look for what's wrong. So really being around those, you know, having better connection community at, the, at its core will also make you feel more nourished, right? Like you're not going to go out into the dating world saying I'm lonely and I don't have friends. You really want to go out there in your fullest self. And that happens through connection. So exactly to your point, maybe it's time to make a few new friends. And of course it's scary. If it's scary, it wouldn't take courage. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so being courageous and doing that. And again, that's why, you know, the recommendation I've often given to people is one event per week. It's actually a very small ask. If you want to set aside two hours per week, to meet someone new. And again, even if you don't meet your person there, talk to people because if you like them, they probably have friends. Yeah. It's a chain reaction. And, and I say this because there's so many people throughout the years. They're like, Oh, I'm praying to God. You know, I hope I meet the woman of my dreams, the, the husband of my dream. And I'm like, you, you can't just wish you gotta do the work. You yeah. gotta do the work and that homework, right. Which is not really hard work. It's just doing it right. Just like going to the gym. I tell people, if you have time to go to the gym for 60 minutes, you have 15, 10 minutes to put an in inner work to be intentional and step up, step up like Melissa here, because let's go back to the beginning of this interview. Who asked who out? Melissa asked Akshay out, right? So sometimes you may say, oh, I, I feel, you know, a, a man should take the lead. Look, guys, at the end of the day, it doesn't work like that. If you want something in life, you got to go after it. Because if it wasn't for Melissa, I don't think this relationship would be what it is right now. And 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 if it, if it wasn't for Akshay having his mindset, his emotions in the place where he is, because when they first met, he was out of it, right? Let's just be <laughs> real, right? You, you see, but it's what it what what I'm trying to get at is get out of your comfort zone, right? That's it. Yeah. And to that point, you know, I was more scared of going on the first and second date with her than all the crazy things I do. And I do very intense, crazy things in the most extreme environments on earth. So people often have this perception of me that like, 
I'm a uber confident. I'm, you know, I'm because I do crazy things. I do very tough things that right. they see the person and they think of me. Even at a podcast interview I did in Austin the other day, the dude met me and he's like, dude, you seem so like chill. You're just smiling and hanging <laughs> out. And he just thought I'd be this super intense, hardcore. And dude, I was terrified going on a date with her. You know, so the point is, if you're a dude, it's okay to be scared. And if you're a woman, it's also okay to take the initiative. I'm, I couldn't be more glad that she did. But, you know, earlier you asked that question about what if a person's not comfortable in their skin? If you're, if there's something you don't like, then work on it, you know, mm -hmm. within yourself. I wasn't always this confident. Neither was she. That confidence happens by doing things, to, doing hard things to prove to myself I am worthy, to honor my own word and to show that I can rise above the struggle. And then I built myself into someone who owns who I am. But that doesn't mean I don't feel scared. I was scared, but I still, <laughs> even driving over to the date with her on that second date when I picked her up, I was, I had dude, anxiety, butterflies in my stomach. I was driving over there to pick her up. And the, the, the coolest part is on that second date, I told her how scared I was. I mean, not like right away, but initially uh, through into the date, I was like, dude, I was so scared. I even was Googling, what do you talk about on a second date? What do you do on a second date? And I was right. telling her this and she thought it was like adorable. And she was sharing how nervous we were. So because I'm so confident because she is, I can share that when I'm scared, right? That comes from a place of confidence, but that comes to like the very foundation of everything we talked about is that inner work is first. You have to develop that relationship with yourself first, because if you don't have a strong one with yourself, you can't bring it to another. Amen. And that's it. Whether it's finding the love of your life, having the best relationship, because one thing, just like success and fame, right? You can get it, but that's where the work really begins, mm -hmm. right? So let's connect the dots before we go into the five C's. If you want to conquer anything in life, you have to A, work within yourself to become the best version. Mm -hmm. And B, once you get there, like I just said, that's where you implement the work and not say, oh, cool. Like example, a lot of people, they get in shape. They want to hire me. Like, yeah, I want to have a six pack by June, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, you do realize I can help you get there. But once you're there, you, you can't just go back to eating Oreo cookies. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> right? it, it's not like, okay, Akshay is acting a certain way. I got Melissa. I got my girl. I'm changing her last name to my last name. And all of a sudden, <laughs> all right, hey, honey, make me some meatloaf. <laughs> and you're like hold on Akshay what the fuck's <laughs> happening here right like who are you so again if you want love you want your career to go you gotta put in the work all right ladies and gentlemen here we go give me Melissa and Akshay and you guys can take terms uh, turns on this the five c's to conquer and have the best relationship starting with number one commitment to self-mastery go this is the foundation, right? This is kind of what we've been talking about is constantly doing that work because then you have awareness of self. What are your triggers? What drives you? What do you need? Clarity comes from within. That's also when we were able to get clear on what do we want in the other person, right? Like as Melissa said, we both had a list of what we want. Commitment to self-mastery always means taking 100% ownership for your world. That, that applies to not just a relationship, to success and anything. But anytime something happens in a relationship, we're, we're both are always like, oh, I'm sorry, that was on me. I'm sorry, that was on me. And we immediately look at how it was on us. And then we were like, okay, then we figure it out, right? What was the issue? What was the gap? Because it's not me versus her. It's us versus the issue, right? So ownership within. You talked about this emotional regulation. We do not snap. That's how we don't get into fights is because when something happens, we can stay still. But where does that come from? That comes from self-mastery. That mm -hmm. comes from being able to train in those spaces. So it doesn't matter what's happening. I can stay still within. We also are so open to receiving feedback from each other. You know, we're constantly, whenever she says, hey, I didn't like how you did this one thing. Got it. Thank you for the feedback. Mm -hmm. I will change and vice versa. And do the, the ability, the how quickly we apply feedback is because we don't make that mean like she's not saying I'm a terrible human being, right? Because she's like, hey, this one thing you didn't like, it didn't suit me. Got it. Awesome. Feedback well received. Mm -hmm. It's not about me. It's about this thing, right? And we can, then we can adapt, but that comes again from self-mastery it's also and, and the thing with self-mastery you don't just stop doing the work <laughs> you constantly do it yes. even now we are still doing it like you kind of said you don't get to a magic x like i'm golden now i'm done right you're constantly doing it that means it also makes life more exciting and more things to talk about the reasons why relationships get stagnant as they often say is because you're getting stagnant when we're doing new things to grow we are constantly on our own adventure. And adventure, I cannot stress enough, doesn't mean skiing across Antarctica. Adventure <laughs> could mean anything. But because we're pushing ourselves in our own way, we bring new fire to our, to not just to ourselves, but to each other that we talk about, that we're excited about. Stagnancy happens if you're stagnant. Self-mastery, 
the growth means you're constantly pushing the new edge. Yep. But both, again, I reiterate, both have to be putting in the work, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. Both have to be putting in the work. Thank you for reiterating. Number two, Melissa, give it to me. Core virtues. Yeah. So this is something we've talked about a lot. And the two, uh, the four core virtues that we totally agree on and rely on is first is presence, right? So really being present with your partner, not being distracted, not being on your phone, our dates, our phones are never out, right? Never. And it's that presence of really being with your partner that creates that connection. And then curiosity, staying curious about your partner, no matter if you've been together for a week, 10 years, 10 months, right? Constantly asking questions, learning more about the person in front of you and bringing that curiosity to your relationship. And with that, we have a lot of play, even though he might seem a bit serious. (laughs) We both are constantly laughing. We're constantly making jokes with each other, right? And so it's that play and that element that really keeps things in that honeymoon phase, right? It's, It's when you stop playing, when you get too serious with each other that you lose some of that. And then the last is courage, really having the courage to bring up the things that scare you, right? It's not that we're both fearless. We're far from it, right? I get nervous, you know, when I ask him questions or even giving feedback, there's still fear, but courage is not the absence of fear. It's moving through it. It's doing it anyway. Yeah. And those really is the core virtues. Absolutely. And, 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 and I get, but I'm, what I'm getting, getting, which is amazing before we go on to number three, it, it, it's just work right? And people think relationship, oh, I found the love of my life. That's it. It's not. It's work, but it's so worth it. Three, Akshay, conflict-free communication. So this is kind of building off. Melissa addressed a lot of the elements of it, right? She has, when he hinted on when he first came in of of how we do that conflict-free communication. So to kind of give you an example of that, you know, like we've had very, very powerful talks of needing alone time. We were at this retreat in Hawaii and we were 17 days together constantly with people or if we weren't people with each other. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of feeling this, like I need some alone time. And so we had a very civil talk. Hey, hey, Melissa, hey, babe, I want to just talk to you about something. And she's like, all right, what? And I said, you know, I'm kind of craving this need for alone time. I just need some space as well. It's got nothing to do with you. I need alone time. And she was like, that's fair. I need, I'm kind of needing that too, you know? And so we were able to have very open dialogues. Kind of what we said is like approaching things as a team, uh, uh, bringing them up before it builds into something terrible. As another example, you know, like some, she wakes up sometimes often earlier than I do. And, and she wakes up with a lot of stuff on her head. So she used to send me these notes of things on her head that she wanted to talk about later in the day. And so we we would, she would send me this note of, Hey, this, this thing was coming up and I wanted to talk to you about it. So we talk about it. And then one morning it woke, I woke up a little later and, uh, and then I saw the note and it was kind of like, I don't want to deal with this right now. You know, I just woke up. I don't want this in my space. So she came up and I was like, Hey, I want to hear what you have to say, what the issue was. So we talked about it. And I just said, Hey babe, are you open to some feedback? And she's like, sure. Do you mind not sending me these notes right when we first wake up? Like, I understand the need to write it out so you can get your thoughts out of your head into your paper. Like, I value that. And it's actually a very powerful tool to do that. But can you please, like, would it be okay to just write the note and not send it to me first thing in the morning because I don't want to wake up with that. We can talk about it later. And she's like, that's a really good feedback. Thank you. Well received. And she stopped doing that, you know? Yeah. And so but we, we kept talking about, we kept too. talking about, and so I would still write down these notes, but then I would say, okay, I'm waiting at least until after lunch. Right. Because knowing that that's like the best space and time, but if he hadn't given me that feedback, he would have continued to get frustrated, exactly. angry, and that could have become a fight. Exactly. Right. Even, wow. even trying to avoid the fight would have become, would have become a, fight. a fight. Exactly. So really, she was so open to the yeah. feedback, and then she she still like she said she still took the notes, and still whenever the issue came up, we still talk about it. We still we still address it, but from a very calm place, and we could say this is something that doesn't work for me. You know, so right. that's how we constantly. And again, this thing doesn't you don't magically do it once <laughs> and it's golden for life, right? We're constantly having things, and we just talk about them. So there's never never a fight or tension even it's very peaceful this right here that is so far is so pivotal because this is going to be one of the most challenging things for people because most people are constantly on the defensive right mm-hmm. they take things personally exactly. and when you take things personally you have to realize you already lost you re- you lost within yourself and you're going to get into conflict you got to remember if you're on the right partnership that your partner's siding with you right? Remember, like you said, you guys said, you got the problem. It's you and your partner against the problem, right? Mm -hmm. You're not the problem. They're not the problem. We're good. But most people, they tighten up, they hide in their little cubby hole. They're going through their little shell. It's like, oh, oh, oh," or they react. Yeah. Yeah. Number, number four, Melissa, cultivate passionate, everlasting connection. 
Yeah, this is a big one. And, you know, it's something that was mentioned a little earlier about really making the other person feel seen, felt, heard. And that comes back to the core virtue of presence, right? Really being present with your partner, but then even going a step further. And this is all about expressing gratitude, showing appreciation, acknowledging the things that your partner does, because so much resentment too, that we've seen in past relationships and other people too, you know, and even probably ourselves at certain points, right. When we didn't acknowledge all the little things is people don't feel seen for the work that they're doing. Right. And there's, there can be friction in relationships. And so for us, something we both have really make it so much a priority is expressing gratitude every single day for our partner all the little things that we do for each other. Right. And whether that's through words of affirmation or little gifts, like there was um, a weekend where I had done a lot of housework and he came home and surprised me with roses. Right. And those are the little moments of things that really cultivate that, that passion, that love, that appreciation. And even beyond that, doing new things together, having new experiences and being intentional about that. That's really how you continue that. Having those new experiences, being present with your partner and having that curiosity about them, their experience with that new experience, right? And so it's those questions and it's it all comes down to presence, really. Yeah, I, I love that and I completely agree. And uh, last but not least, number five, Akshay, create contrast. This is foundational to not just a relationship, but to the entire essence of fearvana, right? Fear and nirvana, two seemingly contradictory ideas that must coexist. And even in a relationship, you want to create contrast. So Melissa talked a little bit about earlier about alone time. Now I'm gone for four months. That's an extreme (laughs) scenario, but you can do that day to day, right? Creating alone time, because like they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder. You only know what something's worth when it's gone. You know, when you know what it's like to be without, it amplifies what it's like to be with. Even in, I talk about a lot in the personal growth example of like, go on a fast and then you'll appreciate what it's like to eat food. Do a cold tub and you'll appreciate what it's like to be warm. Similarly in a relationship, yeah. create alone time because then it builds polarity. You know, knowing even like playing on the edge of masculine and feminine. People see me and think I'm like very hardcore masculine, but I embrace the hell out of my feminine, right? She, she even when we first started dating, she was shocked and like did not see how she's like, dude, you're so much more romantic and soft than I thought you'd be because she thought I'd just be all hardcore, right? But bringing her flowers, the first time we danced was on, a, I, like we, we were on a, in a, under the stars in my roof, right? So, and then sometimes I'll, when I'm on the feminine, she'll be on the masculine energy and we're able to play on that, you know, also like control and surrender. You know, sometimes if she takes control of something, I can surrender. That's another yeah. creating polarity, right? These two opposing yeah. forces that can coexist. Yeah. Like sometimes she'll be like, all right, you, I'm going to take control of this thing. And I'll be like, God, I have no qualms about surrendering to you. You create the plan. You do you. Other times I'm going to control and she will surrender, right? So this means also the ability to do both. So we both have enough confidence to play on. So when I'm saying I need alone time, she's self-confident enough to know I'm not saying it's not, not because I don't love you or anything. <laughs> I just need my space right now. And she gives me that as do I, right? But we're explicit with ourselves what we need. And then with the other, Hey, do you want to lead right now? Do you want to take plan on the mm-hmm. Friday night dinner as a simple example, or even the more, ex- the bigger examples, right? Whatever it may be, whatever it may be is creating that polarity, creating contrast on all edges of the human experience, because contrast gives life its flavor. Mm-hmm. It's how you amplify yourself within and how you amplify the partnership as well. Yeah. And once you have that clarity within yourself individually, which is why you have to put in the work, You meet someone that you attracted that also put in the work, which leaves you where these two amazing souls are at. Wow, guys, that was good. Thank Thank you. you. No, it's just, oh man, you're blessing the life of myself. So many that are watching and listening. And I wanted to just throw one last thing because there might be people, and I say this because I come from pain. You come from pain. We all come from pain. And sometimes- Thank God I, I I I worked through the pain, right? And even though it still lives, I don't let it control me, right? We all, I know each one of you have your own pains, but for someone out there that's so pessimistic and saying, man, it's just, I come from a really messed up upbringing. What were both your upbringings, good, bad, rough, like, you know, empathize with people that maybe didn't have the best upbringings that are kind of stuck. Yeah. And I'll, I'll begin. So I'm very close to my parents and my parents are incredible. And I think that, you know, I, while I had a very positive childhood, 
they're both fairly anxious people, right? So Ooh. a lot of the anxious attachment stuff, we learn kind of anxious ways of engaging with each other. That's not good, right, bad, right? But that's each person is going to come with their own flavor of um, upbringing. So rather than even looking at it as like, oh, I'm, I'm broken. It's like, no, you have your own flavor, yeah. right? And so you will have unique things that are both gifts and things that are opportunities to work through. So exactly. each person just has different opportunities of areas of growth. And that's really what I have to say about that. And that was not drop the mic. That was awesome. We all have our own baggage and it's up to us to change and not live conform to our past. Unwire ourselves, rewrite because we are the authors of our own stories. Mm -hmm. Akshay, what about you? I mean, similar to what she said, you know, like I said, I had a great upbringing. My parents were awesome. I went through a lot of stuff later on after the Marines and the drugs and all that kind of thing. But the, the reality is, like you said, we've all gone through our own flavor of stuff. And at some point, I empathize, it does suck, but you're going to have to do something differently if you want to change. And it's up to you to decide, right? Is the pain of, because be, be, like the, the reason why people stay in misery is the devil you know is greater than the devil you don't. So I'd rather stay in the misery of certainty than the uncertain than the misery of uncertainty, right? Because even though this 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 version of my life is miserable, I'll stay here because the unknown is scary. If I leap into the unknown, I could fall. And dude, I've fallen a million times, literally and figuratively. I've lost fingers to frostbite. <laughs> you know, I've gotten hypothermia, a, a bad bad relationship. So is she. So the thing is, you have to leap. If you, it, you have to leap and you're going to fall, but that's okay. This just comes back to the core virtue of courage. Courage is the foundational virtue. There's nothing I can say or she can say, or you can say that's going to make the fear of leaping an unknown go away. We can provide insights, tools, you know, like uh, ahas to help you step there. But when you get into the arena, it's going to be scary. It's going to suck. You're going to struggle. You're going to go to hard times, but you got to go leap into the unknown or you're going to stay in that misery that you currently are. So I know you've been through stuff. We all have, and I, God knows I empathize, right? But the change, you're going to have to do something differently and do something differently means it's going to be scary. That's where courage comes into play. So work your way, build up that experience of courage, train in small ways, do a cold tub, go leap, go do a hard exercise, go on a five hour hike, you know, do something that is hard. And that's how you build up that ability to face the fear, to exercise the muscle of courage. And if you didn't get inspired after that, you might as well just... I don't know, just eat two bags of Oreo cookies like I used to do and call it a day. No, seriously. <laughs> yeah, Guys, thank you for inspiring me, us, all of us. I encourage anyone that's been watching, listening, go follow both Akshay and Melissa. I'm going to drop their handles right now. They got mm -hmm. a lot of awesome things happening sooner than later, hopefully in 2022. Sorry, 22. No, 24. 2024. Uh, we might be doing a, a little bit of fun stuff. You know, I, I'm big in off affirmations, keynote speaking, where maybe you could possibly meet the three of us and much more. Stay tuned. Keep it caliente. Melissa Akshay, thank you for being you. Make sure to subscribe to my channel if you're a new viewer. And don't forget to click on the bell so you can get notifications every time a new show releases. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and feel free to leave your comments. I'm Jason Roselle and you're watching Get Inspired with Jason.